yes, it brought up fond memories of Ian Gurr. <laughs> with his handlebar moustache I'm not sure you should have been dating a man that looked like Magnum P.I. when you were only 17 well it was he was my first proper grown up boyfriend he had a car and everything and he took me to <laughs> and I remember I had seafood vongole it's amazing <laughs> I can't remember anything but I can remember everything about that date <laughs> 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 Own It, Your Business and Your Life, with Nicola Cairncross and Judith Morgan. In this podcast, we're going to cover everything you need to embrace to become a successful entrepreneur, marketing, money, and much, much more. How to create a business doing just what you love. How to own it, your business and your life. This one will be fast, funny, feisty, and very lively. So sit back and enjoy the show. So, Judith, how was your week this week, then? It was good, Nicola, but why don't you go first? Because I always go first. Oh, all right. Section. You tell me about yours. Well, I've, been, I've had a lot of going out this week, which has been rather pleasant. Um, it was Mother's Day on Sunday, and we spontaneously decided to go to Jamie's with um, Steve, Phoebe and Nelson, which was quite uh, very entertaining, actually. I have a question on that what, topic. What is, what is squirrel pie? Well, I've been watching Jamie and Jimmy's thing on Friday night where they take over a cafe in, in, the, um, in, in Essex somewhere at the end of a pier and they go out and they find um, brilliant food producers and people who are doing interesting things and then they have a celebrity of the week cooking in there and the celebrity is cooking something they remember from their childhood which J- Jamie has recreated for them and then they bring in um, things that, you know, from, the, from the food producers they've found and a couple of weeks ago, there was a, th- a thing about this chap who, you know, they they, they cull grey squirrels in this country. They have to, otherwise they... Well, good, good. I mean, if they could nip round to my garden, that would be great. <laughs> well, they, they kill trees, apparently. And so anyway, they have to cull them. But J- Jimmy, who's the one who runs the pig farm, is up in arms about the fact they waste all the meat. So he was going to, suffi- to interview someone who makes um, delicious squirrel pies and squirrel casseroles and squirrel ragout and all sorts of things. And it's, they're absolutely delicious. And I've got to say, they did look absolutely delicious. There was a hot one and a cold one, a bit like a pork pie, but squirrel. And, um, but you haven't actually eaten squirrel pie, Nicola. Well, no, because Jamie said, and then they did this thing where they got five top chefs to try out different recipes. And Jamie was one of them. And he said he'd put it on his, on his menu. So, of course, when I trolled along to Jamie's with the, the gang... I was all agog to try squirrel pie. <laughs> but it wasn't on the menu no, yet. No, and the but waitress looked deeply cheesed off that yet another person was asking her about it. <laughs> but she was wonderful. We had a lovely time. I had a beautiful um, – the, Phoebe and Steve both ordered steaks, and they were a bit disappointing. Nelson ordered a chicken thing, and he liked it, and I ordered a delicious – cod thing floating in clear broth on top of lots of green vegetables i think that must be paul mckenna at work i wouldn't normally order something so healthy <laughs> i just found my surprised myself with my order um, <laughs> he's starting to work on me and then and then of course it was the x factor live tour last night which phoebe and i had both totally forgotten about and only just got to uh, remember in time to print our tickets which he paid quite a, a king's ransom for at christmas actually and we went along. We went to Brown's first for supper, early supper. Um, now, Brown's is a, an institution in Brighton. I've been going there since I was 17, where I first went with Ian Gurr, who looked rather like Magnum P.I. with his large moustache. <laughs> and we went after the Jacksons featuring little Michael Jackson. 
So that shows you how old I was. <laughs> well, I, I have to tell you that two of my school friends worked in Browns in Oxford oh, in yeah. the 70s. Yeah. So I know exactly what you're talking about with Browns. Yeah. It's just the same, Judith. They keep the deck all the same. The, you know, the, it's always, you know, tall, slightly snooty, but friendly underneath gay waiters. And um, it, the food is just solid, you know, solid, good stuff. I had the most delicious lobster tagliolini. And Phoebe had something really nice with prawns and crab meat and pesto and, you know, a, a small glass of, of wine each. And um, off we went to the X Factor tour, glowing nicely. Um, was it nice, the X Factor tour? Oh, yeah. I mean, and I'd forgotten, to be honest, who, who was on it because it's such a long time ago. <laughs> It's the irony of irony. It's only three months later. We can't remember them having invested every Saturday night for three months. <laughs> well, I said to him, look it up. It, look, we were in the car on the way go, and I said, look it up for God's sake, or we'll just annoy us. But we remembered there was lots of good people. Fleur East was absolutely awesome. Um, Stevie, you know, the, the comedy act yes. was brilliant. Yes. He he could actually really sing. <laughs> In fact, there wasn't a dud one amongst them, um, but my f absolute favourite was um, Andrea Faustini. Yes, yeah. yes, I remember. Actually, when I saw you two in Browns last night on Facebook, I went, well, who the hell is on the X Factor tour? And I went off and Googled it. So I've read the review of the show when it happened in Liverpool, so I know exactly what you've seen, and it sounded rather good. Oh, it was brilliant. I mean, it's I'm, I'm astonished what they can do with a black backdrop, some, some big screens and, and lots of sexy dancers. Because, and, and, you know, there's lots of pyrotechnics, there's lots of fireworks and lots of stuff dropping from the ceiling, little fluttery things and stuff like that. It was all, <laughs> all absolutely marvellous. In fact, it made me, I mean, there must have been several thousand people in there. I don't know how many the Brighton Centre holds, but um, a lot more than when I first went to see brass construction there, that's for sure. But it was great. It was a great evening. I had a lovely time. And, um, and yes, it brought up fond memories of Ian Gurr. <laughs> <laughs> with his handle on moustache i'm not sure you should have been dating a man that looked like magnum pi when you were only 17 well it was he was my first proper grown-up boyfriend he had a car and everything and he took me to Brown, <laughs> and i remember i had seafood vongole it's amazing <laughs> i can't remember anything but i can remember everything about that date <laughs> 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 Well, I must say my life hasn't been anything in your league. Three nice, well, one massive great sob fest, which was comic relief. I love comic relief because it puts it puts our pathetic little problems into perspective. Yeah, we does. have so much to be grateful for. And also I think I'm in awe of their achievement, which is they've raised they've now raised over a billion pounds over wow. thirty years. Where, yeah, where they, over thirty years where they only put the show on every other year. And People, I mean, sometimes you wonder cynically, you know, when Cheryl Cole is asking you to send in money, why she just, just doesn't write them a cheque for a million. But, uh, you know, the, the, you do see a lot of people that you love doing what looks like hard labour to make things happen and putting themselves through hell so that we don't have to. And it, it's clear to me that they've made a lot of difference. There's been some nasty articles in the press this week about how much they spend, you know, not on aid but I mean I think that goes to the territory doesn't it how galling it must be to stand up and do something wonderful and then have people slag you off for it and of course I know nothing about the ins and outs and I'm not saying that I'm just talking about what a wonderful institution it is that our television is given over one or two or three nights a year to these massive fundraising things and how the Brits have got endlessly deep pockets and money just magically appears from nowhere because the cause is, is so moving yeah, absolutely. I saw a rather moving ad yesterday for um, where you just text girl, the word girl, and it was all about helping girls in Africa who are being abused and terrorised and tortured and married off to men, you know, much older than themselves, without handle marmots, sausages, presumably, who, who are, um, you know, and just because they're girls, they've got absolutely no power at all. And I thought I, yeah. I was Blood, that was just before I, we went out, actually, and I, I, it did bring a tear to my eye, that one. And I thought, I did see me. yesterday as well that Michelle Obama is making that her education for girls her cause. Of course she would, because she's, you know, a woman. She's got two daughters. And, uh, and that came across, actually, in the comic relief stuff as well, is that the children in Africa. And, of course, comic relief doesn't just help people in Africa. It helps people in the UK as well. But the children in Africa, however desperate their circumstances, what they know will make a difference to them is an education. 
Well, on a, just to end that little section on a lighter note, there's a rather marvellous video on YouTube of Mich- Michelle Obama doing Uptown Funk. Oh, and I you see know, it. I've seen it. Moves. <laughs> my favourite song and two of my favourite women. I love her. Yes. She's she was on Ellen, uh, Ellen DeWatt, yes. wasn't she? Yes. Yes, I love her. And the two of them dancing made me thought, well, I need to do that in my living room. It's brilliant, isn't it? I know. I, I keep thinking I need to learn the, learn the moves to that. But we'll put a video of Michelle doing her Uptown Funk on the um, show notes for Lovely. Own It Your Business your life episode 19 i believe i know and isn't doesn't time move on lickety split when you're having fun well i'm really intrigued by the fact that we're still in new and noteworthy because that's only supposed to last eight weeks so i suppose it's new and noteworthy not just new or noteworthy so what's fueled your fire this week then judith well, you know how I don't know if this is the same with you, but it, it happens with me that I have sort of some of my old favourites in the line of personal development stuff. And one of my old favourites that I revisit regularly, I'm revisiting again right now, and that's the Abraham Hicks materials, um, you know, where Abraham is ostensibly channeled through Esther Hicks, who, who Abraham and Esther together have a fantastic sense of humour, uh, which helps enormously. Uh, and um it's all about, um, you know, if you want to be happy, be happy. If you, because your vibration, whatever you're vibrating is what you're attracting into your life. So, what if you look around you and see that you've got that's what you've been asking for? And it's usually stuff we don't want because we're so focused on the wrong stuff. There are some fantastic videos all over YouTube. I'm really enjoying them. Some, are med- some of them are meditations, which involve breathing in and breathing out. Some of them are just her being very funny and reminding us of how. We say we want X, but we're constantly vibrating and asking for Y all the time. And uh, so Abraham Hicks is fueling my fire this week. I've got a couple of of their videos that I really like, but there's loads of it all over YouTube, which means it's free to tune in to this very amusing, very upbeat vibe. And I think that's the whole point of it, really. So, you know, it's quite difficult to remember that we have to go first if we want to be happy we have to be happy today to attract more happiness and if we want to be rich we have to feel and and vibrate wealth today and in order to attract more if we want to be healthy we have to choose it and be it today in order to attract more i think that seems around the wrong way to a lot of people who live their lives on the basis of i'll be happy when yeah absolutely and uh, i'm not very i mean i know what you're talking about but i'm not massively familiar with it so i will go and have a look but isn't abraham a host of angels not it's not a bloke. i don't know whether it's a host of angels it's a host of um uh, Why it's a hope it's definitely more than one person yeah and um it's um i don't know what you would call it a collection of beings entities spiritual i don't know collective spiritual wisdom from beyond channeled through esther uh i don't i don't attempt to explain that neither do i look into that too closely to be honest yeah i look into the wisdom that is very humorous, humorously um, conveyed. Uh, yes, yeah. Um, Abraham coming through Esther has a fantastic sense of humour, which I like the idea of actually very much. That uh, whoever these entities are, wherever they are, they haven't lost their sense of humour, which you tend to think of as a sort of earthly thing, really, something that we need to get us through, but clearly not. Well, there's several things there. One is that I'm deeply impressed that Esther's managed to make a a very good living out of this rather than being locked up in a loony bin. So she's obviously got something going there because most people would, you know, who said that sort of thing would have been locked up. Um, The other thing is that there was a a Buckminster Fuller thing going around on Facebook this week that said something along the lines of, you'll like this, we have enough wealth, and it's very fitting actually for the comic relief thing, we have enough wealth for everyone on this planet to live better than most people ever have. If we just stopped spending it on wars and started spending it on technology and sharing and education. And I saw you post that and yeah. I liked it. And, yeah. and it, it is true. And, and I think the, the shame is, and, and I don't want to make this political at all, but it's happening increasingly right now that it's not so much that we spend it on wars as as that the, the, the haves and the have nots. The haves, I think, you know, 27 people in the world have more wealth than the rest of us put together or something like that. It's just completely inappropriate. I'm not even really a socialist, but there needs to be some redistribution of wealth. Yes. I don't know if that's the way forward because that would stop people aspiring. And... No, but they don't need that much, Nicola. We don't need most of the world's wealth to be owned by 27 people. 
But how would you feel if you earned a lot of money and then they they forcibly took you, it off you? No, I'm not talking about forcibly taking it off us. It's just that we don't want to get into the politics of this now because it's not what this podcast is all about. OK, I'm not going to forcibly take it off anybody. But, you know, when you get to the stage of, I mean, for instance, Bill and Melinda Gates having to give it away, aren't they? Because they've got so much and they recognise that, you know, there's only so much any one person needs. Yes, and, and they've chosen what they're doing with it. So the, yeah. just to finish the point about that I was going to make there is that Buckminster Fuller was was someone who I picked up on very early on when, you know, training as a coach. I liked his yeah. quotations. But yeah. there was there was actually um, one of our best authors, Ian M. Banks, wrote a series of books called um, About the Culture. And the culture is a very, um, you know, off in the future, like 500 to 1,000, 1,500 years in the future, where we've we've been intervened by a bunch of uh, a consortium of benevolent um, aliens who took one look at us and realized that we were going to blow ourselves up and ruin the planet if they didn't step in. And it was against their policy normally, but they could see that we had so much potential, but we were, you know, just going to blow ourselves up with it. Their their the books are full of humor. They this they, they you know everyone nobody needs to work. Everyone gets what they need to live. But people tend to choose to pursue passions and things. And that's really cool. And they get to travel around the universe completely free in these huge sentient spaceships who've got the most brilliant sense of humor. And so have the robots that do all the work for everyone, because nobody has to do any work, of course, because there's robots to do it. And and but their, their sense of humor is just awesome. And I just, I, you know, just there was echoes of that in, in what you were. Well, saying. maybe that's the thing, isn't it? That actually anything humorless isn't really is not going to light your candle or mine. Yeah, that's right. It's got some humour in it. And also, well, yeah. perhaps humour is something that evolves. You know, as people evolve, perhaps their humour, you know, perhaps it's something that's that's necessary for being able to laugh at yourself, being able to laugh at your right. circumstances. So maybe, that, maybe that's the message. We all take ourselves too seriously. Yeah. Stop. I think that's what Comic Relief reminded me of as well. You know, get over yourself. Look, you've got so much. Let's go to what's fueled your fire this week. Well, starting to work with other people again. You know, I've, I've, I'm rounding up some, some victims to, to help me in because I'm, I'm honestly, Judith, I, the Facebook ads clients are coming in faster than I know what to do with them. And um, even the people who I spoke to a couple of weeks ago, who I didn't think were going to go forward, are now sending me money. So I've really got to got my act together. And so what in my in the who or what's impressed, I'm going to tell you about a couple of um, software tools that I'm ex- I'm trialing to see if they'll help with the whole communication thing. Because when you've got four or five people in a team and they're all emailing each other, it all your emails start to mount up quite yeah. dramatically. Yeah. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I'm, I've recruited uh, my old VA and um, to do to do some VA stuff for me. She's got two kids, but she manages to fit in a load of work. I don't know how she manages. Actually, I do know she's got a, a job where she goes off to work in a golf a luxury upmarket golf resort and sits there all day with nobody coming in to buy villas. So she, she, you know, she manages to, and, she, and they know she does other stuff. So she just gets away from the kids and goes and works somewhere quiet. <laughs> hmm. And then also um, Inga, who used to do social media for us at Raw. Um, I'm, I'm training her up to do, help me with the Facebook ad side of things. Hmm, brilliant. And yeah. obviously Sarah's on the team as well. So it's, it's really, really nice. I'm really enjoying it. We sort of got a client challenge and it's not specific to any client this week, isn't it? No, it's not. I thought we might talk about Facebook ins and outs, things that you know, things that I know. Just compare notes and see if we can't share some stuff about Facebook that might be useful for all clients trying to get their heads around it a bit. Yeah, it's interesting about Facebook because um, Twitter came along first. And I really, really liked it. I loved what well, you did, too, didn't you? We both loved the yes. discipline involved in 100 yes. characters. Yes. Do you remember the story in six words thing? that we I do. I think, they still, I think they still do that occasionally. That's impossible, actually. <laughs> a bit like a haiku. And, yeah. um, and, then, and then Facebook came along and I just immediately loved it. And I think it must be something to do with the, the highly visual nature of it, the fact that it's so picture driven and you can see people's faces. And you can on, you can on Twitter, too, but they're tiny, aren't they? Yes, they are. Yes. So it it immediately became my social media platform of choice. And when we were tweeting, you know, when we were taking selfies last night and trying to work, you know, Facebook was just the first place to post them for me. I yeah. couldn't yeah. bother to do the others. So what, what do you like about it particularly? 
Um, I don't know. I didn't like it to begin with. When you were all over it, I thought, oh, it just looks like for the kids for me. And then actually what happened was, and you explained this, the kids moved off because their mums and their aunties, like you and me, had moved on. Um, I like how easy it is. I like that I can write at any length. I like that I can... It, me it means that I can get all the benefits of face-to-face -face networking without leaving the house. Yeah. It is. And that I can engage with people around the world, I like as well. Mm. See, we could do all that on Twitter, but it's not the same, is it? Because of, because of the, is it, do you think it's because of the restrictions on the amount you can post? I think Twitter is too fast moving. I think it's yeah. moved into, well, for me, and I think it's moved into another area which is altogether very useful. It's about news. Uh, breaking news, you know, photographs yeah. of things happening now, um, social kind of angles as well, how it can be used to draw attention to things. Uh, it's very fast moving. It's a news feed almost, you know, what's going on, who's commenting on what's going on, that kind of thing. However, having said that, as I agreed with a client this morning, I find that when I put my energy there, I get more traction. So obviously, you know, where you put your energy and your attention you, you get more back from it. So when I ignore it, it doesn't work for me. When I go there and play for a bit, it works surprisingly well still, even though it's much, much busier than when you and I were first on it. Much easier to connect with specific people on Twitter, I find, than Facebook, because most most well-known people are up to their friends' limits, and they, so they've started using pages, and it's not very easy to connect with them, because if you send them a message when you're not their friend on, on their page, then it goes into their other... Oh, no, that's not true, actually. If you send them a message to a page... It goes into the pages, messages and notifications. So theoretically, the person running the page should see it, if if not yeah. the person itself. But you find yeah. most people manage their own Twitter account, so it's much easier to actually speak to the person on Twitter. Right. So let's. So that's sort of one of the first things people need to realise, isn't it? That. Um, yes. The other thing is that, of course, that the Facebook timeline, which is why they keep making all these changes to the algorithm, they're actually trying to protect us because if we saw everything that all of our contacts posted every single minute of the day, that feed would be flying past at the speed. Oh, so it would be completely overwhelming, wouldn't it? It would, yeah, and it would be yeah. so fast like Twitter. So that's why they try to create these algorithms that, that based on what we interact with, we see more of or less of. So yes. I was intrigued by your comment the other day that you kept seeing negative and, and frightening stuff. And I, I don't ever see that stuff. So, Well, it isn't. Uh, I can't actually remember what provoked. I mean, you know, yeah, you're right. I, there are people and I, I think Marion clarified it in response, which is it, I think it's the, the, the glass half full people. And I don't want to be in their reality, really. So it isn't that I like it. It's just perhaps sometimes that I notice. I can't remember what the news story was that day that people kept commenting on. And I don't really want to know. There's lots of things that go on in the world that I don't really want to know about, Nicola, quite frankly. Well, the, the tip there is to um, on the top right hand side of a post like that, there's a little drop down arrow and you can actually Oh, so I often I use want that. To see yeah. less of this sort of stuff. Yes. I want to see I less often of this use person. That. Yeah. I often use that. Yeah. yeah. And I think, and the reverse is true, of course, which is you only have to like and share one or two posts to to be shown an enormous amount more of it than you would actually like. Funnily enough, so you have to be careful. I think in both directions. Um, I'm not sure the thing that likes make a difference. I think you have to actually comment on stuff for it to be. Um, recognized uh, i think it, i don't think i've commented i think i've shared and so for instance carol look who's a big eft lady in the field of abundance i've shared one or two of hers recently and now she's in my timeline every day which is it, it there needs to be a balance somewhere in the middle i think um because mm. it means then i have to pull back from enjoying her stuff in order to see less of it which is rather weird yeah but anyway what i wanted to know was do you know can you explain succinctly what's the difference between reach and engagement? It's something that's measured on insights on yeah, when you've got a page. I do know. So if you've got um, if a post and it gets, I don't know, uh, 30 people reach, then then that's the amount of people out of all the people who've liked your page that have seen it. Yeah. So you can then boost the post to extend your reach to the people who've liked your page. Now, if some someone on your who's liked your page likes it so much they then share it, your, your reach extends because it goes out to the number of people that they're connected to. They won't all yes. see it, of course, because of the things we've been talking about. But yes. it, it extends your reach. 
Now, what was the other thing? Oh, engagement, right. Well, engagement is when people actually do something. So whether they like, yeah. comment, share, whatever, that's the yeah. engagement. So so really, it's it's irrelevant what your reach is. It's more about your engagement that's important. Yeah, yeah. And when you go on the Insights page, what are you looking for and what do you learn from it that causes you to do to behave differently? I don't I don't bother with that. I'm, I just no. concentrate on um, on sharing the content I want to share. Uh, okay. responding to people and then boosting you know posts for example our podcast I'll boost occasionally yeah so I'm not and, um, yeah I'm not bothered I, I, I'm only interested in outcomes rather than actions okay and what did you how did you learn to do Facebook ads what what course did you study I took I took about five courses working up to the big yep. daddy which is traffic genesis which costs several thousand dollars and um, was extremely mm-hmm. extensive and run by Laura Betterly who's popularly thought to be the best in her field at this but I did I did Justin Brooks course I did John Loomer's course I did um, any other free courses that have come along I've done um, in and I've just created my own system really out of, out of all of those and would you recommend one of those as affordable and useful to the ordinary listener? Um, yeah. they, they've all got their own strengths, really. Um, none of the, there's a really good John Loomer course, which is called How to Use Power Editor, which I would recommend, which is about yeah. $79, $97, something like that. And that is okay. really good because Power Editor is and, – and then it gets you into – you can also book um, an hour with John for something like $300. If you've got specific issues on your ads, he will actually go in with you and fix them. But he's not hes not a consultant. He won't do other people's ad campaigns for him. Um, there is a really good pay-what-you-want course that Justin Brooke offers. You have to join his mailing list, and then he, he puts it on occasionally. Um, and that is – all about it's called the the Facebook work ads workflow i.e how to set up your campaigns and everything but the problem with both those courses is they are not strategic they're tactical so they're how to use power editor and how to how to set up your ads and monitor them but it really you've got to back up a bit to, to the strategy I've inserted this bit after while well, listening to the edit. I've acted like a complete idiot here because, of course, I have a fantastic little course that teaches people how to do Facebook ads the way I do them. And it's part of my Fast Start Masterclass, and you can actually access that at the moment for $79 a month. So if you're a quick learner, you could actually join, learn how to do the Facebook ads part of it, and then leave again. <laughs> And that's something that was thrown up today by um, the response of someone I spoke to on recommendation the other day. And I'm going to try and be very generic. So do tell me if I'm getting too specific. But they've got a live webinar next week. Then they've got a program launching, you know, which is going to be live sessions, which they're presumably recording at the end of April. And they've been trying to do their own Facebook ads. They haven't been succeeding. They only got four conversions to the webinar registration. Um, they got 95% conversion to their from their list, but their list is only 100 odd people. And then they got four. Now, I don't know what that is as a percentage, but they only got four conversions from Facebook ads. But she said she only put something like $25 over three over a week and a half or something like that. So there's no strategy there. And there's no thought that if she spends $500 on clicks, will she make will she sell one place on her course? And the other issue she's got going on there are she's got a live webinar because she's been told that live webinars sell best, but she's got nobody registering for it. And the other problem is that if you do a live webinar, a lot of people will just look at the date and the time and think, I can't do that. So she says she's been stressing that if they register anyway, they'll get the recording. Um, But, you know, people just don't they ignore that, really. if, If they can find any reason not to take action, we're all so overwhelmed with all the things we need to do. If, yes. if you look at something and think, oh, good, I can't I can't do that time. <laughs> and then quite. <laughs> and, and then you've got the thing of, you know, she, she, she's scared to invest money in case it doesn't work in promoting her live thing. But then she keeps talking about launching it and she can't launch it because she hasn't got anyone to launch it to. She's got no audience, she's got no list, she's got no clicks, she's got no leads. So it's a, it's a challenge, this whole thing. You have to be – if you're going to do all that work – you have to have someone to launch it to. And yes. Facebook is the most affordable way to do it. 
is it? Well, totally, yeah. I mean, Google AdWords, for a start, you're, on Google AdWords, you're you're only advertising to people who've already realised they've got a problem and they're looking for the answer actively. Yes, yes. Whereas on Facebook, you can put your offer in front of someone who might have the problem but hasn't actually thought of what the solution might be yet. Yes. But when they yes. see your offer, they'll think, blimey, that's it, that'll help. So if we before we get into Facebook ads, the ordinary user of a Facebook page, which is quite difficult, isn't it, for us? Oh, I tell you what, you know, these stories we've had over the last couple of weeks about how many people got how many you know, interactions with things on pages and da, da, da. I did share something over the weekend, which I thought was mildly interesting, not massively interesting. And I shared it on my page. I shared it on my page and uh, it only had something like four words on it. It got a reach of 544 people, which was considerably more than anything else. It's, there's quite a lot of randomness to Facebook. You don't really know what people will like, which is why I was asking about the Ace of the Insights page. Yeah. So what, what I'm working up to asking is, you know, for a new Facebook page owner, what are your three top tips? Oh, I love the way you scrub the <laughs> <laughs> Right, OK. I, I would... If you enjoy sharing memes, which is what we're talking about here, a picture with a yeah. with a saying, then yeah. do it. But for, you're not going to, you know, there's no, I don't know if there's any way to track what that engagement and reach did for you. Yeah. Um, the best, a better way is to put something fabulous on your own blog and then share it onto Facebook as you, as you, you know, so you put the meme on your blog as a blog post. You yeah. go and use Google URL shortener or Google URL tracker, actually, I think it's called. Hang on a second. Let me just find out what it's called. To make a link to that blog post. And then that's the link you would share on Facebook. And then you would be able yeah. to see by logging into your Google URL tracker account, yes. which is free. Yeah. By the way. URL shortener. Uh, it's not it, actually the Google URL shortener is good because it will tell you how many clicks you've got. But there's a Google URL tracker. Tracker. I can't remember what it's called now. Hang on a second. Keep going with the principle for the moment. Okay. Okay. Which is uh, we've made a we've made a blog post. We shortened it and we to something that we can track. We share that on Facebook and what happens? And then and then you get your five hundred thousand reach or insight or engagement or whatever. But you'll be able to tell specifically what outcomes happened from it. So it has you know if if it it links up with your Google Analytics this thing I'm talking about and it you can set goals in that. So you could have two goals, Judith. You could have or three three or four goals which is are, are that, you know, someone opts into my mailing list, someone joins up to Club 100, someone becomes, you know, whatever, whatever. So so you can have three or four goals. And the the way you set goals up in Google Analytics, you can just Google how to do it. It's really easy. It basically involves a thank you page. So anyone who lands on the thank you page is, is a goal achieved. And then yeah. what this Google URL tracker will do will tell you which specific bit of content generated those actions. Okay which is really, I know it's a bit geeky for you, but it's, it's oh, here we are, Google Analytics URL Builder. And that will also... It's a, it's a bit geeky for the person I had in mind, which is they've got a brand new Facebook page. Um, you, you, you're, you're giving me intermediate steps, I think. What, what, what Somebody's just opened their page today. What things would you be doing in your first month? Okay, I'd be adding great content. I'd yeah. be linking that great content back to my blog. Yeah, a less geeky tracking thing would be just to look at your Google Analytics and see how much of your traffic each week is coming from Facebook. Yes, and you could monitor that number, and that would tell yes. you if your actions are working or not. So yes. I'd be putting a, a mixture of content. The well, thing I'd definitely be doing is uploading video straight to Facebook. It's got your Facebook page. Facebook is really trying to go head to head with YouTube now, and these short videos that you upload direct to your page are getting much more reach than anything else will. And then, and then you can, um, you know, if it gets, you've got to, you've got to have a call to action in in the video, which is to yeah. go to your website. But that's 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 yeah. all. So I'd be if if it's you know if you're a coach or someone who's got an expertise or whatever or passion, I'd be uploading lots of short videos. They've got to be under um, twenty minutes or under one megabyte, I think, no gigabyte. Okay gigabyte um so yeah i'd be putting vid videos on there i'd be putting mixed media but making sure it links back to my website rather than just stays on facebook page um and i'd be looking at 
building my page likes. I'd be, you know, I would do some, I would do perhaps a course on how to use Power Editor or even, you know, look on YouTube how to use it. And I would be building my page likes, but not building them just willy nilly. I'd be actually specifically putting my page in front of people who have the same interests. So, for example, you could put your page in front of Esther Hicks, the people who've liked yeah. Esther Hicks's page. Yes, that's the trick. And also limit the countries. Don't don't just do worldwide. Just say I only want um, likes from America, Canada, uh, England, Ireland, uh, Australia and New Zealand to start with. And only people who in those countries that like, say, Esther Hicks. And I would yeah. set up perhaps a series. I mean, you can get likes really cheap. I mean, I'm, my angel healer client, I was getting likes for her for 10 cents a like. Yes. But what it does is it builds up a body of data about the people who like your page. And then you can yes. also go and see what other pages those people like. If you've even got 500 likes on your page, then you can go and then see what other pages they like and what other interests those people have. And, and when you say you can then go and see, where do you do that? How do um, you do that? Well, the first thing you need to do is swap your um, Facebook language in your settings, your personal profile settings to US English rather than UK English. Okay. And then you'll be able to use what's called the graph search bar, which is the, the, the Facebook search bar at the top. You'll be able to put in um, pages liked by people who like. What's your page called, Judith? Business Oracle, Small Business Oracle. It's not uh, the Small Business Oracle, yeah, I think. Small Business Oracle. Judith, we're getting a bit geeky. We're getting a bit geeky again. Yeah, I know. When you finish this thought, we need to move on. Okay, all right. Well, I've just typed in um, the graph search bar, pages like by people who like Judith Morgan, the, the Small Business Oracle. Yeah. And um, annoyingly, Facebook appears not to have that functionality working right now, so it's telling me I didn't okay. didn't get any results, but I would normally get results. But maybe. Yeah. yeah, it may be small business oracle without the the. Let me just no, no, it's found your page all right. It's just not finding. Oh, it has. It, it did okay. it yesterday, so I think there's an issue with Facebook as well. It may be that they're asleep. <laughs> it could be all three of them. <laughs> well, it's it's still it's still bedtime in America, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's um anyway. So so that it getting likes is not is is actually worthwhile doing as long as you're not buying likes willy nilly. It getting good targeted likes by putting your page in front of people who like pages like your stuff is a really good. And you do that by advertising. Yeah. You know, there's when you set first set up your page, they offer the offer you the chance to um, advertise your page. Yeah. I'm not sure how good that basic advertising is, but if you go and look at it and you see that they're offering you the chance to choose your countries and cho choose people by interest, then, then I would yeah. go for it because you don't have okay. to power register. But if you can't see the choice to limit the countries and the interests, then I would definitely bone up on how to use power register. Okay. And I've never even heard of power editor before. And is that a functionality that we find within Facebook? It's, it's, it's a, an, an app that sits on top of Chrome. So you okay. have to use the Chrome browser and, and it, you just, it's like a little add on to Chrome. Okay. But, but right, any, now this is turning into a massive geek yeah. fest. I think we should <laughs> move on because okay. I think some people would have fallen asleep. Where, <laughs> What's your word of the week then? Well, following on from my Abraham Hicks thing, it's vibe or vibration. Light attracts light, dark attracts dark, radiate what you want and be a vibrational match. So this has been quite a challenge for me this week, but I've I've deliberately tried to be a vibrational match. So literally a bit like, you know, let's go and do Uptown Funk in the living room. How you would feel at the end of that is sort of. Uh, out of breath, happy, upbeat, and how music makes you feel and dancing makes you feel. And that's the vibrational match, happiness and light and upbeat that brings more of the good stuff. So I think it's very easy not to notice how you're feeling and what you're thinking. And that's what my post was about that you referred to about, you know, the stuff that you see. It's, um, you know, it's a great day today. It's easy to be upbeat on a great day, but actually you need to be updated on a, on a day that's not a great day as well. Uh, so vibration is my word of the week. How about you? Outsource. Oh. You know, I don't think people realise how cheap this can be done. Um, you, often when you put something on a job on Elance, you get all sorts of ridiculous quotes, people chancing their arm. And that used to put me off 
But now I know that you can put something on and you can actually say in your job description, I'm looking to pay around $100 to get this done or whatever, $50, $20. And and you'll be astonished how inexpensively you can get things done by very good people around the world. And it takes a bit of effort because you think to yourself, I could have blooming done it myself in this time, except when you come to something like that you can't. And I've just spent three or four weeks looking for someone to integrate my new forum with with something called Danacast, which is um, a shopping cart, effectively. And I've now found someone who is doing it for four hundred dollars instead of twelve hundred dollars that I was originally quoted. And I've broken it up into four stages. So she only gets her first hundred dollars when she's done stage one. She only gets the next hundred dollars when she's done stage two. And that's the way to limit your your risk. And then, of course, the money goes. And I don't pay anything into a scrow, which is when um, Elance holds the cash. Yeah. Um, Yeah. If I'm using a new, um, you know, until until I'm used to using that supplier, I won't pay anything into a scrow. They have to prove themselves to me first. No, and I like the idea of having suppliers because it means you don't have to give them just one job. If they do one job and they do it well, you might use them again for a similar job. Oh, absolutely. And I, you know, I, I've asked this. This girl says she's a specialist in integrating APIs, which are the things that enable bits of software to speak to each other. And and yeah. you know, I've I can think of lots of things she could do. But but yeah. you know, so but how much more you get done when you start to outsource jobs and you stop having and it's it's a bit of a fine line because you don't want to outsource too soon because it will affect your cash flow but then it, you know you're generally not speaking doing enough to attract so much business that you need to outsource if you're not outsourcing do you know what i mean so again it's about yeah, your business a bit if a you want bit, to get yeah. to the next level and sometimes that can be a little bit scary yes i agree it can be scary but actually if you can't do it and you don't want to learn how to do it you're mad not to outsource it really aren't you yeah especially when there's you know people out there doing such amazing jobs around the world yeah (laughs) i must say i've always held to that belief that just because it's a little bit difficult to find the right person on these platforms to begin with doesn't mean it's not worthwhile and ultimately that you'll find somebody who you'll build a relationship with and have in your you know rolodex for when you need that sort of work doing well absolutely i mean i've just had um my low business logos designed and you know, I could probably have got it done cheaper on 99 designs or something, but I, I had three graphic designers who I've used in the past. So I just put the job out to those and got, you know, got the best quote back. Yeah, perfect. You know, Inga and Patricia I found on Elance. Yeah. And they're people I've worked with steadily over the last two or three years. And one of the yes, graphic and, and it, it wasn't your belief this in the beginning that, no. that, that outsourcing could be this easy. So I quite like you um, reiterating this oh well i had it bashed into me by neil didn't i who who actually is is the poster boy freelance he, he was actually featured in the guardian or the the financial times i can't remember which one as being someone who runs his business from all around the world and, and outsources completely so yeah he, he he knocked it out of me judith it was very good <laughs> yes very good good So who or what's impressed this week then? Well, um, I'm going to tell you about one of my clients. Like yours, I'm not going to name her by name. But um, when new clients come to me, they're often very ambitious and impatient for early results. And as you know, it doesn't always work like that. Um, But this week, which is quite soon, we only really started working together in February and it's only March. She sent in an email that said, I realised I've been really self-centred in my approach to my work. It's all me, me, me. How much money can I make? How can I raise my profile? How can I be successful? Instead of really feeling in my heart that what I want to do is, and then she went on to talk about her clients. I think that's a really interesting turnaround to come so quickly, which is, you know, business isn't all about me, me, me. It's all about them, them, them. And you've got to make it about them, haven't you? Yeah, it's, um, I'm a narcissist, so obviously I struggle with this all the time. But, <laughs> but um. What what prompted her change? Do you know? I think she just had a sudden realisation, like a bolt from the blue type of thing. Um, I don't know. There was nothing I said or did. And that's why I was impressed by it, because it came you know, out of nowhere suddenly. I think actually what she'd done was she'd signed up for a leadership course with the Landmark Forum. I don't know if she'd actually been on the first session or whatever, but she had a bit of a turnaround. I mean, I think I do encourage my clients. There's no point in setting up a business that doesn't meet all your own needs. But if I just sat here talking about myself all the time, my business is all about my clients. And if I lose sight of that, I'm mad. Yeah, absolutely. And and there's, um, I, funny enough, Suzanne Jorgensen, one of our mutual friends, sent me yeah. a link 
to one of my own blog posts the other day saying this one was rather a corker. And it was all about how this woman had run up my mentors, one of her, his group coaching calls, who, funny enough, he'd been on the landmark. And um, she said, how can I make money fast? And the whole thrust of his reply was, how can you find a group of people to bring value to? So, yes, it's absolutely. Not about you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this woman already knew who her audience were, but she just, I think, must have woken up one morning and realised that she was looking in the wrong direction. So that impressed me that she had that realisation apropos of nothing at all, um, which is it is a, 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 in, in the personal services field, in the you know, the coaching and the mentoring and the teaching and the personal development space. It's all about them. And your your quote, do you remember, was it about, what's the one about how do you find the rivers of abundance will flow to you? What's that one? Yeah, that's Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. If you can find yeah. the biggest number of people to serve, the rivers of abundance will flow for you. Yeah, well, there you go. So actually, it is about service. And I quite often joke when people say, can I can I call you? Yeah. How may I serve? You know, it's quite a funny joke, but it is. That's really what it's about. It's about it's about the joy often of being in service to other people. Yeah, absolutely. And when you're doing a great job for someone and it's really getting results, there's, there's nothing better than, than that feeling, is there? The no, work, it is a good feeling, absolutely. But it's like a bonus, isn't it, on top of the dot. Now, tell me who or what's impressed you. Well, it's a bit of soft, two bits of software. I'm not going to go too oh, deep into them. No, no, really, I'm not going to go too deep into them because <laughs> I started using them. But I, keep, I kept hearing about um, Trello and Slack. And Trello is like a more visual version of base Basecamp, you know. But Basecamp. Yes, I've heard I've heard of Trello actually. Yeah, and it's supposed to be really fun because it's very visual and you can move little cards around from lists. And I've, I'm really quite enjoying starting to use it. So have a look at that if you're if you find Basecamp a bit boring. I haven't found what what Trello does better than Basecamp yet, but I'll let you know when I do. Um, and the other one is Slack, which is um, is sort of like an internal team communication tool where you don't have to keep sending each other emails all the time and it's much more search searchable so for ex, you know for ex, so it gets like there's five of you emailing and copying each other on everything it just becomes completely overwhelming and if you want to find something you know someone sent you you can't find it because G, the gmail search facility is not that not all that really so yeah slack is is a sort of it's like an internal chat system that's entirely searchable integrates with trello interestingly and also integrates with gmail and google docs so I'll let you know how I get on with those. They're both very cheap. I think they're five dollars a month per user. So um, yeah, tre- Trello is very nice. I'm I'm enjoying that already. And that was your postman, I think. It was. He <laughs> he must be late today. <laughs> hey, Nicholas Postman makes an appearance. <laughs> and we, you know, he hasn't actually rung the bell, so we're we're good. We're good to go today. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, that's that's a great call. Thank you very much, Judith. Always a pleasure. Not at all. See you next week, doll. Bye. You've been listening to Nicola Cairncross and Judith Morgan. The podcast is called Own It, Your Business and Your Life. Do come and visit us at ownitthepodcast.com. We'd love to hear your feedback. You can find out more about Judith and visit her on her website at judithmorgan.com and you can find Nicola at nicolacairncross.com.